Welcome. We are so glad that you are here. Um, yeah, this is always such a joy for me to come together on a Sunday and pursue the Lord together as one body, right? So it's so cool. Uh, if this is your first time, welcome. It is great to have you. If you're joining online, it is great to have you joining us. Um, we know a lot of times you will check us out online before coming in person. So this is your personal invitation. If you're watching online, come join us on a Sunday morning sometime. It would be great to have you. So yeah, um, good morning. We are super excited for all that's happening today, but I personally am super excited for what we're going to be diving into here this morning um, and just what the Lord's put on my heart for this morning. I think that what we're going to be talking about is really um, instrumental in breaking free from a lot of stuff in our lives, but to be able to walk in true health, freedom, and boldness as believers. Um, and with that being said, am I getting a little feedback? Um, with that being said, uh, we're going to be talking about intimidation and breaking the spirit of intimidation over our life and really kind of dive into this so that we can walk as free people, um, not walking in intimidation. So, um, yeah, we're going to dive into that. I believe it's so important for us, one, because I believe intimidation is one of those things that the enemy uses. Um, it's one of his tactics that immobilizes a lot of believers and makes a lot of believers kind of get in this place of just getting by or, you know, just living a comfortable life. But when we grasp what we're going to be talking about today um, and break the power of it, we walk in a greater sense of boldness, a greater sense of pursuing the things of the Lord that he has spoken over us. Second, as I believe that as a body, there are promises and things that the Lord has for us as Newport and as a region that is not going to be able to um, be walked out by us if we are timid people that are not uh, walking in the boldness the Lord has for us. So that's why I'm excited about this morning. I believe that after this morning, there's going to be things that um, you might do that will surprise you that, oh, I've never been able to do this for the Lord before. I've never, you know, I've always kind of sensed that as part of what the Lord's called me to do, but for some reason never did it. I believe there's going to be freedom to do that after this morning. So, um, yeah, let's dive in here. Uh, intimidation, what is it? A lot of us have a good idea maybe of what it is, but I'm just going to level the playing field here so we're kind of all starting at the same place. So intimidation in its simplest form is allowing fear to affect your actions and or thoughts. It can make you do things you know you shouldn't do, and it will make you do th not do things you know you should. So that's what intimidation is, is the spirit of fear that kind of alters your actions and thoughts from the place of where you know you should be doing. So the scripture we're going to be looking at throughout the whole morning, and probably read it three or four times, is found in 2 Timothy uh, verse or chapter 1, verse 7. And we've probably heard it a lot, um, and that's for good reason. It's a good passage. But it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and of timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. So today, that's what we're going to be looking into. And before we go any further, I think I'm just going to pray real quick and just release this morning over to the Lord. So God, thank you so much just for being here. Thank you that you love to be personal with us. You love to encounter us. You love to speak to us. So God, I pray Lord, that this morning that our ears would be open to what you are saying to us, that we would be focused on you, that distractions will fall away right now in Jesus' name. Just pray Lord for peace to go throughout this room right now, that anything that was brought in, anything that people are carrying this morning, that there would just be a release of that so that they can focus on your heart this morning, God. God, I pray, Lord, that your voice would be loud in our hearts, that we would be able to hear and be encouraged directly from you, God, whether it's through the words that I'm saying or through worship or just through um, listening to you, God, that each one of us will walk out with fresh revelation this morning that will shift the way that we live. So, God, I pray, Lord, that you would just add to or take from anything that I've prepared and really just yeah, encounter us in ways that only you know how to, God. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so moving forward, we're going to look at a few different things. We're first going to take some time, just kind of look at the symptoms 
of a spirit of intimidation and kind of what that can look like in the tangible realm in our lives and maybe help us to um, diagnose or just identify uh, areas that we might be walking in this. We're then going to look at the root of intimidation and what actually gives intimidation its power in our lives. And then finally, which is going to be my favorite part of the message, is we're going to look at God's game plan on how to live intimidation-proof or free from intimidation. So super excited. Um, There's a lot of power in this. And as it is a lot of times, uh, as as pastors and preachers are preparing messages, there's a lot of times as we're working through some of this stuff, like the Lord's actually working on stuff in us as well. So this is coming out of a place where things that God has broken off of me even just recently, um, and recently, like, this is coming out of a season where I realized that there's areas where I was just allowing myself to be intimidated in. And I'm like, what is this? Why am I feeling these ways? And um, that's kind of why it's so fresh on my heart to teach about. So uh, we're all in good company here, all right? So first thing first, again, looking at 2 Timothy, we see very clearly that it says that God has not given us a spirit of fear and intimidation. So that word spirit in the Greek is actually pneuma, and that is the same word spirit that is used to describe the Holy Spirit, the human spirit, and demonic spirits, all right? So we see that we're not just messing with, uh, or not just encountering things like a weakness of... Uh, character or a weakness of um, mind or something like that is actually a spirit of intimidation that can come on us. And when we're dealing with things in the spiritual realm, it's not something that we can just do harder, or have a positive mindset towards to overcome, but we actually have to uh, fight it in the spiritual realm, which we see quite clearly in Ephesians 6, where it says, "...for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies." but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. So we see that we are not fighting against flesh here, right? And what happens when we just try harder in this realm of, like, just fleshly things is we end up just coming against the symptoms and fighting the symptoms of a core issue, Um, And that's a lot of times what will happen specifically with the spirit of intimidation is we'll might at some point take on that spirit of intimidation and see the symptoms start to pop up in our life. And we start to attack those, but we're never actually quite focusing on the root and attacking it actually in the spiritual realm. And I heard it said this way, that intimidation is kind of like a fruit tree, where if you're trying to hide the fact that it's a fruit tree, you can take fruit off, you know, discard the the fruit, but in seasons, that fruit's going to grow back. The symptoms are going to grow back, but unless we cut the root of that tree, you know, it's going to continue to be a fruit tree, right? It's the same thing with intimidation. Unless we focus our attention on the root and sever the root, the fruit of that intimidation is going to continue to grow, even though we might cover it up for a season or take care of it for a season. um, They will come back if we don't take care of it. So let's take some time and look at some of these symptoms that may help us to identify when areas that we might have intimidation in our lives. So I'm going to ask a few questions, and it will be pretty clear how you answer these questions if there's areas where intimidation comes in. So um, a few of these questions is, do you sometimes feel like saying no to someone, but you say yes instead? Or do you feel guilty when you say no? Do you find that when it comes to you having to do something that you've practiced and was easy in practice, but when it comes time to do it in front of people, it's hard or maybe even impossible? Do you find yourself avoiding confrontation with certain people or maybe just avoiding certain people in general? All right? (laughs) Do you find yourself at a standstill, paralyzed, not knowing what to do or not feeling the strength to do what you know to do? in certain situations. These are all signs that there might be areas of intimidation or areas where we've allowed the spirit of intimidation to affect how we are living. So more in-your-face symptoms, and these ones are a little bigger, and not all of these are always rooted in intimidation. I just want to clear that up. But a lot of times, there is a root of intimidation that leads to these. And uh, those are things like depression, loss or lack of vision for your life, 
and fear of man. So if you're like me and you hear this list, there's probably part of you where it's like, oh man, like at some point in my life or maybe even currently, I can relate to some of those. Like some of those make a lot of sense to certain areas of my life. And again, do not feel condemned. Do not feel shame in that. As I said, the Lord really has worked this through my life actually on multiple occasions. Um, so you're definitely in good company. And a matter of, a f- matter of fact, all throughout the Old and New Testament, we see examples of godly men and women who also have fallen into this season of allowing intimidation to affect how they even do ministry, how they live their life. And one of those people is the prophet Elijah. So Elijah is known as one of the best prophets in history, one of the greatest. Uh, but he has a very clear season in his life where he's allowed the spirit of intimidation to affect how he did ministry and to affect his obedience for the Lord. Um, so a little backstory on Elijah. Um, he was a super bold prophet in the Old Testament through First and Second Kings. And he did things like the Lord, you know, speaks to him, and he'll go before kings and rulers and call out their sins and say, this, the wrath of the Lord is coming on you because of this sin. Bold things like that. He would go, um, you know, the Lord gave him a word that there would be a famine. He spoke that out, and there was a famine for three and a half years. And then when the famine was to end, he prayed earnestly, and the famine stopped, and it began to rain. Uh, he saw people come back to life. There's a young boy that died, and he prayed and that young boy came back to life. And then one more event that I'm going to spend a little bit more time in, in his ministry, that some people kind of view as like the pinnacle of his ministry, is this encounter that he has on Mount Carmel, all right? Where um, the king of the day, uh, Ahab, you know, was really promoting Baal worship. And there was actually 450 prophets of Baal throughout the region in that day that were, like their job was to, you know, worship Baal and to, you know, promote Baal worship. So in this moment on Mount Carmel, what happened was um, Elijah was like, all right, what we're going to do is we're going to kind of have like this little battle to prove whose God is the true God. So what we're going to do is you're going to prepare an altar. You're going to, you know, ceremonially set it up. You're going to prepare the bull, put it on the altar, And then you're going to pray to Baal, and he is going to provide the fire. That's the only thing you're not going to provide. You're going to do everything else. And if he ignites that, he's the true God. And then I'll do the same thing, and we'll see whoever's God provides the fire is going to be the true God. So they do this. Um, The prophets of Baal are crying out for hours and hours around noontime. Elijah starts poking fun at them, saying, hey, like, Maybe your God's sleepy. Maybe you went on vacation. Maybe you're not loud enough. So they start going crazy. You know, they start cutting themselves. They start screaming out to Baal, and nothing happens, all right, Um, which proves, obviously, that Baal was a false god. But then it was Elijah's turn, and what happened was he prepared everything, and he actually had them bring barrels and barrels and barrels of water and saturate the whole altar to the point where the trench that was around the altar was full of water, the, everything was just soaked in water, and he called out to the Lord, and God sends fire from heaven, ignites not only the um, part of the sacrifice that normally would burn, the wood and the bull, but all the stones and the soil and all the water was engulfed in this fire, proving that God was the true Lord, right? So this is kind of like this big moment in Elijah's ministry but then the very next thing that happens is Ahab, the king, goes back to where his kingdom is in uh, Jarel, I believe. And Elijah runs out actually faster than the chariot, gets there before Ahab. But then Ahab, I'm going to read a portion of scripture here in 1 Kings 19, 1 through 5. and kind of paints a picture of this moment where something shifts in the heart of Elijah. So Ahab told uh, Jezebel, who Jezebel, by the way, if you look throughout the previous passages, um, it's very evident that she's carrying this spirit of intimidation, where she uses death and threats to get her way, and she's kind of this 
She's the wife of Ahab, but like she's kind of the power hand in that um, ruling where she will you know, use her power to intimidate people. She's, she's really carrying the spirit of intimidation. But Ahab tells her all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all 450 of the prophets. I missed that part. That after, you know, God proved himself real, the 450 prophets were killed uh, that were prophets of Baal. So he tells them all this stuff, and then hear what Jezebel does. Jezebel sends a message to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. So in current terms, she's saying by this time tomorrow, in the next 24 hours, you know, the Lord kill me if I don't kill you. So essentially she's saying, I'm going to put all of my energy in the next 24 hours to capturing and killing you, Elijah. And we see that Elijah, this man of God, that previously did all these incredible things, it says that he was afraid and ran for his life. And it says that as he was running for his life, he came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, left his servant there, and continued going another day's journey into the wilderness, came and sat down under a broom tree. And under that broom tree, he kind of hits the slow point where he asked that he might die, saying, it is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under the broom tree. So here we see um, some very clear signs that Elijah had taken up that spirit of intimidation from the threat from Jezebel um, to the point where he's actually depressed, you know, sitting under a tree asking to die is signs of depression, right? And then uh, we see this low point. And then from there, uh, just to kind of breeze through a little bit, God tells him to go on a 40-day journey, gives him some supernatural food from an angel that supplies energy for 40 days to travel. He gets to Mount Sinai, and the Lord comes to him and says, what are you doing here? And you can imagine Elijah's like, well, you told me to come here. But um, he gives him this big sob story where he's like, oh, they've killed all, you know, the men of God, blah, blah, blah. I'm the last one, and they're trying to kill me too. And that's the story that he gives God when he asks why he was there. And then the Lord kind of ignores that and is like, all right, I want you to go out on the high peak of this mountain, and I'll speak to you there. He goes there. And this is where we've heard this passage before where there's a big wind, and God was not in the big wind. There's an earthquake, God was not there. There's fire, God was not in the fire. But then there's a still, calm breeze and a whispering voice that was the Lord. And it's kind of funny. In that moment, the Lord says, Elijah, what are you doing here? So now two times that um, God has asked him to go somewhere and then ask him why he's there. And Elijah does not get the picture. Usually when God does things twice like that, he's trying to teach you something, and you should probably think about it. But Elijah doesn't catch that. He's like, oh, I, you know, they've killed all the men of God, and I'm the last one, and they're trying to kill me too. The same exact word-for-word -word sob story that he gave earlier, he gives to God now. And then God kind of lays out a game plan for Elijah from that moment. He says, all right, what I want you to do is go from this place I want you to anoint Hazel, king of Aram, to be king of Aram. Anoint Jehu to be king of Israel. And then I want you to anoint Elisha as your replacement, essentially, is what he's saying. So um, I don't know all the background of what God's heart was here, but it's almost like God's giving Elijah this chance to kind of understand like what had happened in his ministry and what he had taken up. And after not getting it, not getting it, God's like, all right, like, I'll still use you. I'll still give you these things to do, but I want you to train up this um, prophet under you, Elisha, to take your place. And we see from there out that um, that moment on Mount Carmel was kind of the pinnacle of his ministry. He continues to do ministry. God continues to use him, but we don't see a necessarily super large caliber things following his ministry after that. Um, and 
He raises up Elijah. And one thing I like to point out here is that out of that list of things that God gave him to do, the only thing he did in the rest of his ministry was to anoint Elisha. He didn't anoint the two kings in his time on earth. Uh, later we see that Elisha actually takes on that mantle and does that and sees the hand of God come in mighty ways, um, defeating a bunch of evil kings, defeating Jezebel, um, all under Elisha kind of taking on the ministry that Elijah did not finish. But um, we see very clearly there that even Elijah, the man of God, fell under this spirit of intimidation. Um, as I said, I personally spent years of my life kind of battling the symptoms of this, not knowing what it was all throughout, you know, being a young kid through middle school, high school, very timid guy, very, like, afraid of a lot. Like, the fear of man was really a staple in my life, to be honest, that I kept dealing with and would do good, but then fall back into it. Do good, fall back into it. And it's just like, what, what is this? It wasn't until the revelation of intimidation, like the spirit of intimidation, that some of that could then break off and get set free from. Um, so, anyway, so what happens when we keep putting our energy into the symptoms? If we keep putting our energy into the symptoms, what happens is we will eventually come to this place where we just accept, this is how I am, this is what it is, and you kind of get burnt out. You kind of use up all of your supply fighting the symptoms instead of the root. So it's so important that we understand what the root of this is and uh, attack it there. You know, actually have a good fighting tactic on how to overcome intimidation. So looking at the root, we're going to read 2 Timothy again. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and of a sound mind. I believe the root of intimidation and... Um, yeah, I believe strongly that the root of intimidation is actually self-preservation, like selfishness, self-preservation, trying to preserve yourself. And why would I say this? Well, looking at 2 Timothy, we see that it groups both fear and timidity together as one. And if you think about it, I don't know if you thought about it, what gives fear its power? All right? Fear is actually kind of a selfish thing if you think about it. The thing that gives fear its power is the question of what's going to happen to me. When you're fearful, if you stop, take a moment and think about, it. all right, why am I afraid of this? Oh, it might do harm to me. It might affect me here. It might, you know, affect me is usually what it is. Now there is, I don't even like to use the word fear for this, but there's like healthy fears or healthy concerns a lot of times, but those are usually selfless, like for your family, like, you know, being wise, there's discernment in that. Um, but that's not what this is talking about. The fear and intimidation is selfish, focused on how do I protect myself in this moment. And that's what gives intimidation its strength. So I like to use the story of Simon Peter to illustrate this. We see throughout Scripture that Peter is always the one that has something to say. He's always the bold one, you know. He's like... Um, Oh, I'll come out of the boat. Just call me walking on the water. We see that um, when God asks, who do they say that I am? And he gives him an answer, and he's like, but who do you say that I am? And he has something to say. He says, you are Christ, the Son of God, which is all true and so good. So we see that there is this level of boldness within Peter and kind of this outward going guy. We even see that he's in the inner circle, the inner three of Jesus, um, close friends. But um, I'm willing to say that boldness and outgoing does not necessarily equal free of intimidation. It's not the opposite of intimidation. A matter of fact, a lot of times an outgoing demeanor is a cover-up for timidity. Let me put it this way. Do you ever feel like you have to overcompensate to cover up your fears and insecurities? Have you ever felt like you had to fake confidence or appear strong to impress others? Um, that's all rooted in that intimidation where I have insecurities, I have fears in this moment, and to protect either how people view me or protect you know, certain outcomes on myself, I'm going to present myself in a way 
that will kind of put a shell around me of, oh, I'm the outgoing one, I'm the bold one, when in reality you're just covering up parts of yourself that you're afraid to show. So I believe that Peter was kind of walking in this some, because there's a moment in his life where because of certain situations, we kind of see this intimidation come out. So throughout Jesus, or Peter's time with Jesus, we see this boldness, and this happens all the way up to this moment in the Garden of Gethsemane. And what happens at this pinnacle moment in Peter's story, when, not necessarily the pinnacle of his whole life, but up to this point, the pinnacle, is in the garden, you know, he's full of boldness, and people are coming to get Jesus, and he takes one of the two swords that all of them have, um, going against this fully weaponized army that's coming to get Jesus, and he cuts off someone's ear, all right? And that's pretty bold, pretty outgoing, right? Pretty confident. And uh, we see that after this moment, later that night, he then denies that he even knows Jesus in the presence of a servant girl. So clearly between that moment and the moment where he denies Jesus three times that night, one time in front of a servant girl, something shifts. Something in how he perceives his actions shifts. And um, a lot of people just say, oh, well, Peter is just a chicken, you know. That's not true. He cuts off someone's ear in the midst of a fully armored bo or army, right? So what happened is sometime in there, either he picked up the spirit of intimidation or the spirit of intimidation that he was already carrying kind of presented itself. Um, so in the Garden of Gethsemane, there is this moment where up to this point, for the most part, Peter's life with Jesus went pretty smooth. There's things that went a little rocky, but Jesus always kind of stepped in and helped and guided him. And for the most part, like, things kind of went the way that he perceived they would. Jesus kind of did things that he's like, oh, like, I know Jesus enough. I kind of know what he's going to do in this situation. Even when he walked on the water, he began to sink, but Jesus reached out, pulled him up, right? Um, and he kind of had that as a background. And what happened in the garden was when they came to take Jesus, I would imagine that moment when the crowd was surrounding Jesus, trying to push him off the cliff, and he just kind of sneaks through the crowd. I can't help but think maybe that's going through Peter's mind where like, oh, this is the same kind of thing. They're coming to get him. He's going to get us out of this somehow. So out of that, I'm just going to attack this guy, and he'll get my back, you know. He got my back. And instead, Jesus heals the guy's ear and then allows them to take him. So now Jesus does something that is completely opposite of what Peter expected, right? And it kind of reveals this aspect that maybe Peter's confidence was not so much rooted in Jesus himself, but more of his perception of Jesus, or maybe even more than that, if you dive into it more and look throughout other scriptures, some of his confidence is actually rooted in the approval of people rather than the love of God or the confidence in God alone. And um, it's kind of funny that Gethsemane in the Hebrew is, um, means oil press. And that's definitely what happened that night in Gethsemane was Peter was pressed and the oil that came out was the spirit of intimidation. So we see that he denies Jesus three times, one time in front of a servant girl. Um, but I love this story because there's, this is a story of restoration and redemption in this. Because we see then later on after Jesus is resurrected, he comes back to Peter and kind of has this moment similar to Elijah where, you know, God encounters him, speaks to him, asks him a question, and um, gives him this chance to kind of evaluate where he's standing, what he's believing. But Peter, you know, when Jesus comes with, hey, do you love me? Peter's like, yes, I love you. I feed my sheep. Does this three times. I believe that's a key moment where the revelation of God's love for Peter kind of opened up, where he's like, man, like, I, you know, denied you. I did all this stuff, and you're kind of bringing me back in. You're forgiving me. You're kind of setting me free of my past, all right? And we see later on that through that and through the 
um, in filling of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost, Peter becomes bold for the Lord and does later what he was unwilling to do that night after Gethsemane. He wasn't willing to lay down his life for the Lord that night. But we later see that he was actually crucified on a cross, but he was like, nope, I'm not going to die like my Lord. So they flipped him upside down on this cross and dies for the Lord. So we see that redemption in Peter's life, which is awesome to see. But in that moment in Gethsemane, there was a pressing. So, um, sorry, I just want to make sure. I'm... Cool. So, yeah, again, it's that revelation of the love of God that kind of broke that in Peter's life and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. Um, which kind of brings us into the next part and the part of the sermon that I'm super excited about, and that is God's plan for an intimidation-free life. All right, God's heart for us is not to walk in timidity, right? Because he has not given us that spirit. But uh, as we read in 2 Timothy, it tells us what spirit he does give us, all right? So first thing first, God's plan to break free from timidity and live a lifestyle of boldness. Um, first off, if you remember where we started, that it says that it's a spirit of intimidation. So we have to start there. You know, certain things have to be broken off of our life. If we're walking in the spirit of intimidation, there's actually action that we have to take, verbal, pick up our authority in Christ, which we'll get to here in a moment, that we have a authority to break off those spirits and principalities, um, as it said earlier in Ephesians. Um, so we got to start there, which we'll have at the end here. I'm going to lead us in a prayer to kind of break that off and kind of, um, yeah, set us off in that way of um, breaking off the spirit of intimidation. But after that, after we break off the spirit of intimidation, there's a lifestyle that we can live to help prevent us from falling back into the same traps, to f keep us from falling back into this place where we take on that spirit of intimidation. And I believe... The key to that is found, again, in our key passage in 2 Timothy. It says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, which we already took care of. We figured that out. But the last part of this says, But he's given us a spirit of power and love and of a sound mind. And uh, newsflash for you, this spirit that he's talking about is the spirit, the Holy Spirit. All right? These are all characteristics of the Holy Spirit. But this is his game plan and his lifestyle that he's giving us to walk in that will prevent us from picking up the spirit of intimidation moving forward. So the first part of that is the spirit of power, all right? What does this look like? What does it mean? And for, to figure that out, we're going to look at David, uh, who really grasped the reality and the revelation of the power and strength of the Lord, all right? Uh, David wrote in Psalm 27, 1, it says, The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? So right there we see, and if you read throughout Psalms, you'll hear that same thread throughout many of his um, passages. But he's saying that the strength of the Lord cast out fear, essentially. That he's so rooted in the strength and the power of the Lord that fear has no place. And if we get to that place where we're grasping that same revelation, all right, of God's power, it will break the power of fear and intimidation in our life. So a little backstory in David. David got the truth of this, like the revelation of this, really early on. We see um, kind of the earlier uh, days, he's one, the youngest of eight uh, sons, all right? So the youngest little boy, I don't know if many of these have many brothers, but it can be a lot of fun, but also it can be pretty intimidating, right? A situation where you can be pretty intimidated throughout uh, your older brothers. And this is where we find David. And where I want to pick up the story is this moment when the Israelites were fighting the uh, Philistines. And there's this, like, war hero that the Philistines had. It was like a 10-foot-tall giant just massive guy. We know he was super strong because his armor alone weighed 200 pounds. And um, every day, you know, morning and evening, it said that he would come out, taunt the Israelites, and say, send your war hero out, and we'll fight, and that will be the determining factor. We don't need our armies to fight, but I want to fight your war hero, all right? And he would do this 
every day, 40 days. On the 40th day, um, David's dad sends him with some supplies to take to the army and take to the battlefield to his brothers. And David brings it, drops it off, and then goes to his three older brothers that were uh, there fighting and, or not necessarily fighting at this moment, more hiding, but he has three encounters with three different people, David does, where the spirit of intimidation is trying to be forced on him. And we see that in his confidence in the Lord, he is able to withstand those three encounters. The first one is with his older brother. He comes, at that moment, Goliath comes out, throws out his taunts at the Israelites, and in the midst of his brothers, David is like, who is this unclean Philistine? Like, why is he allowed to uh, blaspheme the Lord's army? And his oldest brother hears this, and he's like, "Uh, what are you doing here? Like, get out of here, go back to your sheep. I know the pride in your heart. You just want to come here, watch the battle, and you just want to somehow be part of this. And David, confident in the power of the Lord and confident in his identity as well, and knowing that the Lord has things worked out for good, says, nope, there's a purpose I'm here, uh, essentially is what he's saying. But then because of this, they take him to the king. And this is his second encounter where intimidation is trying to be put on him. Um, He goes to the king and he tells the king, hey, I'll fight this guy. Like, you know, I'll do it. And the king starts to try and intimidate this little teen boy, right? David was just a, like a teen at this point. And he says, you, like you're just a small teen. Like what are, what are you going to do? But David speaks out testimonies of God's faithfulness, his history with the Lord. He said, no, 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 you don't get it. You know, I watch over my father's sheep, and the Lord has delivered both a lion and a bear into my hands, and I have overtaken them and defeated them. And the Lord's going to do the exact same here in this situation. Like, that is a confidence in the power of the Lord, right? Like, he knew for a fact that it wasn't his strength that was going to defeat Goliath. You know, you stack up the odds, there's no way. But he was so confident in the Lord's strength and power that he was able to break that intimidation and say, no, like, I am just a little guy, but I'm not the one fighting, right? And then, again, the king, you know, tries to lay it on again, like, well, here's my armor, at least. And David's like, nope, haven't tested it, not doing it. Um, so that brings us to the third part, his third time where David is confronted with the spirit of intimidation, and it's when he actually comes out to fight Goliath. He has a sling, he has his little shepherd's pouch with stones in it, and he's just standing there, right? Um, but Goliath comes out, this giant, and starts to, like, mock him, saying, what, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? Um, and he actually tells uh, David, he's like, I'm going to destroy you and the birds of the air and the flesh or the um, beast of the field is going to eat your flesh. All right. Pretty intimidating stuff. Right. But David turns around and I'm going to read the passage because it's really powerful it is first Samuel 17 verses 45 through 47. He said, then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with sword and with a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give you or give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into my hands. If that is not a man that is so confident in the Lord's strength that physical realm does not even affect his decisions, I don't know what is, all right? David is such a clear picture of our portion in the Lord's strength that we have. Like, we can walk in this same level of boldness, the same level of courage and confidence and the strength and power of the Lord that David did if we understand the fullness and reality of it. So that's the power of the Lord, all right? That's what we're looking at. That's the spirit that God does give us, you know? He doesn't give us fear and intimidation, but he does give us the spirit of power and love and a sound mind. Um, Acts 1.8 says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, 
and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So there we see that when we receive the Holy Spirit, God's power shall come upon us. So the second part of that per, or passage is, all right, power, now love. What does love look like? What does the spirit of love look like in our lives? What does it mean for us as we take it on? First um, John 4, 17 through 18. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here on the world or in the world. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment, and this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. So here we see that as we live in God, we grow in perfect love, and it casts out fear. But if we are afraid, it's because we have not fully experienced the perfect love of God. When we have not got the full revelation of God's love, it's impossible for us to live in a way where we're walking out that love towards others. But it's also impossible for us to live in a way where we're willing to lay our life down for God. All right? If we don't grasp God's love for us, we will not come into this place where we can fully surrender to him because he has some side agenda that we don't know because he doesn't fully love us. He just kind of, you know. But if we fully grasp this love and the spirit of love, it will set us free in the same way that Peter did, right? You know, he wasn't willing to that night to lay down his life for the Lord. But when he realized and got the full revelation of God's perfect love for him, and was filled with the spirit of love on Pentecost that he was able to then lay his life down. So we are going after that same revelation, right? That is what we're going to be um, praying into today. But as we receive the spirit of love, that's what we're looking for, is to break, um, yeah, to break the power of fear in that way. Romans 8, 5 says, But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. See, God's love for us is so great that before any of us even had a chance to try and do things to earn his love, that he sent his son to die for us, to set us free from the power and the bondage of the sin that we will commit, right? So that is the level of love that we're looking at here, where he laid down his life before we could do anything to earn it. And that gives, this next verse gives that verse even more power when it says in John 15, it says, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friend. The love of God is selfless. He is so selflessly in love with us that he would lay down his life for us. That is the love that we are stepping into as we step into the spirit of love. All right? Um, one more verse here is 1 first John 3 1 see what kind of love the father has given to us that we should be called children of God and so we are so this is the love of God I want you to just kind of think about those some of those verses and just grasp the fullness of the love of God his perfect love see the a perfect love has no fault that's what the word perfect means so God loves you without fault. His love will never fail. It doesn't fall short. It is more than enough for anything we face. And that brings us to the third and final part of the spirit that we are now stepping into when we step out of timidity into the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. So what is a sound mind? A sound mind is one that possesses the knowledge and wisdom of God in any given situation. So in other words, a sound mind is when you know what God wants in any situation. It is the fullness of God's wisdom and knowledge, or at least the growing in the wisdom and knowledge of God. And that's what gives us a sound mind. So, um, yeah, just think about this. There's not much more in life that is intimidating than being in a situation that you have no idea what you need to do, right? 
That's pretty intimidating to be maybe in a position where people are looking at you for direction, but you have no idea what to do. That's because the lack of wisdom, the lack of knowledge, is actually a like breeding ground for intimidation to take hold of us. So that's exactly why Ephesians 5.17 says this, Therefore, do not be unwise, but instead, what the will of the but yeah, but instead, what the will of the Lord is. And then Proverbs twenty four five says, "A wise man is strong; yes, a man of knowledge increases in strength." So there we see the power of knowledge; it gives us strength, and that's really cool to see because it actually ties together some of these other points we talked about. The power of the Lord and the strength of the Lord is paired up with the knowledge of the Lord here, right? Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. So there it's almost like a warning, like do not lack in this area, pursue it. Uh, we see in Proverbs 4, 7 through 8, the beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom, though it cost all you have. So here the Lord's saying that wisdom is worth Everything you have, no matter what you have, give it for wisdom, because wisdom will strengthen you, wisdom will guard you, and wisdom will give you the spirit, will help nurture the spirit of the Lord in your life if you're pursuing me, pursuing my wisdom. Uh, and one more verse here is James 1.5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to you. We must gain wisdom and knowledge. And right here, it tells us a really good starting point, right? It says, if you lack wisdom, ask for it, and God will give. You know, he will not hold back. He wants to give us wisdom. He wants to give us knowledge. So that is what we're after here. And then um, there's two more passages I'm going to read that kind of segues into my next sermon in two weeks. So a little preview there. Um, but Psalm... Oh, 111 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. And then Proverbs 1 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So in two weeks, I'm going to be talking about the fear of the Lord and what that looks like. Because here it says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of knowledge. So there's something there that I feel the Lord has for us as a, a church body uh, that I really want to kind of dive into. I'm really excited about it. The Lord's already given me some um, wisdom into that or insight into that. I'm really excited. So that's in two weeks. But um, yeah, wisdom and knowledge gives us a sound mind in Christ. So we're going to go into a time of ministry here. So Jen, if you want to come up and just kind of play the keys a little bit um, as we kind of go into closing here, how we're going to do a few things as we close up here. So earlier I'd mentioned about the spirit of intimidation and how we have to kind of attack it differently than just having a positive mindset towards the symptoms, but we actually have to attack the root of it. Um, so I'm going to actually lead us in a time of prayer and ministry here as a whole church. And if you are sitting out there and you've kind of identified maybe some areas in your life where intimidation has affected how you've done things, um, I want you to join in as I lead us in that prayer. So we'll do that. And then uh, after that, I want to just kind of pray a blessing over us, pray for the filling of the Holy Spirit that brings power, love, and a sound mind. And then we're actually going to do something a little differently than we normally do. Um, I have a song that we're going to play. It's called Sound Mind by Melissa Hauser. And it's powerful, especially in regard to what we just talked about, where it just kind of refreshes our minds. Uh, we'll play that in a little bit here. Oh, we'll hold off on that a little bit. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> My bad. I thought the song was playing. Um, you're good. <laughs> um, but yeah. So we'll do that, and then um, during the song, uh, prayer ministers, when that song starts playing, you can kind of come up front here, and if you need ministry during that song at all, for anything, but specifically in the area of breaking intimidation in your life, uh, I want to challenge you to come up, 
get prayer from one of the prayer ministers or just grab someone that is around you. Like, there's nothing special about prayer ministers, nothing special about me or Cherie or any one of you. We all can, you know, pray for each other. We all can minister to each other. So um, that's kind of how we're going to go through the rest of the morning here. So, um, yeah, I'm going to lead us in that prayer real quick to break off the spirit of intimidation because we have authority in Christ. God has given us, a, you know, authority. It says we're not fighting the flesh, but we're fighting those powers and principalities and spirits, right? And God would not tell us that we're fighting that without giving us the authority to do so. So we're going to uh, step in that authority this morning and invite you to do the same. Now I'm going to lead us in a prayer to break off any spirit of intimidation. And then I'll pray a blessing for the filling of the Holy Spirit that we can walk in a lifestyle that will in turn make us intimidation proof because of our relationship with the Holy Spirit. So you can repeat after me if you would like. Say, God, thank you for your spirit. Thank you that you have not given us a spirit of fear and intimidation. This morning, I break the power of the spirit of intimidation. In spirit of intimidation, you have no room in my life any longer. Any area where the spirit of intimidation has affected how I did things, I repent and I renounce any agreements that I have made with the spirit of intimidation. I break it off right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, God, I just pray, Lord, for a fresh feeling of the Holy Spirit this morning. Holy Spirit, come and fill us afresh this morning, God. Yes, Lord, just in 2 Timothy there, it says that you are the spirit of of power, love, and a sound mind. I pray, Lord, that you would just come and fill us this morning, that you would um, protect us against picking up the spirit of intimidation again in Jesus' name. Let's pray, Lord, for a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit right now. Holy Spirit, come. Fill each one of us this morning that we can live in a way where we are not affected by the fear of man. We are not affected by the fear of others' thoughts. Yes, Lord. Thank you that you give us the strength to walk in the fullness of what you've given us, God. Thank you that you are the spirit of strength and power that no matter what comes our way, no matter what we walk through in life, that we can stand firm just as David did in confidence knowing that you will come through. Yes, God. Thank you that you carry the spirit of love, that you fill us with the spirit of love, God. I pray specifically this morning that we will grasp a deeper revelation of your love for us, God. God, I even give you permission to kind of wreck us in this revelation of your love, that things that we've um, accepted to kind of uh, hinder our acceptance of your love, that those would be broken off right now, that the fullness of your love be released over us in Jesus' name, that we can then in turn walk in that same love. And finally, God, I pray, Lord, that you would give us a sound mind this morning, God. That you would give us wisdom and knowledge that any situation we step into, that we can walk in the knowledge of you. That we can walk in the wisdom of you. That we cannot be intimidated by the lack of knowledge, but that we would be empowered by the knowledge that comes from you and the wisdom that comes from you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much for watching this teaching. I hope that it impacted you in some way. If you enjoyed this teaching and would like more teachings like this, feel free to subscribe to our YouTube channel and get updated each time we post a new sermon.